Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, so we are back today continuing from the last class where we studied what is cognitive psychology and what is the subject matter of cognitive psychology. So, in that class earlier class we saw the basic uh, subject matter of cognitive psychology, what are the various inputs from various schools of psychology to cognitive psychology, what is it that we study in cognitive psychology and the various paradigms uh, which are there for the study of cognitive psychology, how they explain mental events and mental facts. In the last class we discussed cognition is about understanding mental events and mental facts or how does mental processing take place on mental events and how does the mind come into play and what role the brain has in the mind. In today's lecture, we will look at the various ways of studying cognition what are the various uh, methods which are available for studying cognition. So, let us begin. Uh, there from the start of cognitive psychology and the or the heydays of cognitive psychology, there were several methods which was out there to studying cognitive psychology. The basic uh, method that primitive cognitive psychology or artificial intelligence used did not employ any role of brain into it. So, the earlier the first advent of cognitive psychology or the first uh, wave of cognitive psychology basically banked on information processing theory. And so, information processing theory was all about mental processing, how mental events pro get processed to say uh, several uh, mental mechanisms and what is the input, what is the output that kind of. Uh, uh, process or that kind of structure was what you are being studied by cognitive psychology. So, information processing theory as we saw in the last class actually uh, looks at the events and the mechanisms processing mechanisms uh, through which mental events or mental uh, activity is generated. In contrast, artificial intelligence was uh, also looking at how at the process level mental events are uh, studied and both of these methods did not play or did not emphasize the brain in any ways. As we know today that uh, the mind is actually a software kind of a software or mind is actually a, a fact which is made by the brain and so studying of the brain is very important in studying uh, cognitive psychology. Now, some of the uh, main reasons why the brain should be included in the study of cognitive uh, psychology is to understand uh, the dissociation and association, the process of dissociation and associations, because these dissociations and associations will tell us what processes are similar if two mental acts takes place and what processes are different if in two mental events or two mental process uh, acts. To the heart of this debate is the idea of localizing those brain areas to finding out those brain areas which act up, which show activity when a particular cognitive uh, act, a particular cognitive process is initiated. And so, what the new uh, cognitive psychology or the new field of cognitive psychology is looking at not only the information processing or the artificial intelligence approach where mental process events and uh, various other uh, mental events are studied, but in relation to it the new wave of cognitive psychology is also looking at brain areas 
of how brain areas or what brain areas are really uh, involved in producing cognition. There are multiple methods of studying cognitive psychology as I said and so each of these methods use a different measure, a different way to study cognition. Now, these methods all have their own problems and all have their own limitations and what has to have what to study to you to find out a complete method or a perfect method to study cognition would take into account the input from all these methods. Why should we do that? We should do that as multiple methods when they provide information what would happen is that the limitation of one method could become the benefit of other method and the benefit of one method could serve as or could add up to more of our information. And so, when looking at multiple methods, when looking at multiple ways, multiple uh, ideas or multiple approaches to studying cognition, this will give us a more complete picture or a more desirable outcome of what cognition is all about. Now, the general goal of cognitive psychology is to study dissociations and associations at the level of the brain. Now, when I say dissociation and association, what is it that I actually mean? Dissociation is a fact or a term which explains that one if two processes or if two mental acts give rise to activation in one area of the brain, how do we dissociate it? Simply stating what it would really mean that an event, if an event or a variable leads to brain activation during the processing of one task, but does not lead to the brain activation on the other task, this is what dissociation is. This will tell us which task requires that particular men mental activity or that particular mental process and which of the task does not require that particular mental task. Let us understand this with an example. Alan Bradley developed the idea of working memory and so what Bradley said is that there is a whole conceptualization of the central executive uh, component of memory which uh, executes most of the uh, uh, working process in, in working memory and within the central executive or with the central executive are other parts of uh, the working memory which is uh, the spatial store and the phonological loop. The idea of the working memory is conceptualized in this way that input or the encoding uh, from the environment is thrown into the central executive which then assigns the audio input, the auditory input into the phonological loop and the visual input into the spatial uh, uh, and spatial loop or the spatial store. What does this mean? It means that at the level of processing itself, at the level of encoding itself or just after encoding, the mind takes away two inputs from two different senses and processes them separately. Now, the same region of the brain is involved in storing the phonological uh, 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 loop or the phon phonological matter and the special matter. Is that true? So, experiments were done to find out whether this and the, as, uh, the assigning of the visual uh, input and the auditory input into different stores or the working memory, whether they use the same mental uh, uh, mental process or the same brain areas. And if different brain areas were activated, then we could say that both the task, the tasks of assigning the, uh, the auditory input into the phonological loop and the visual input into the spatial sketch pad, they require different brain areas. And through this, we can then specifically study one of these areas or the deficit in one of these areas. So, Alan Bradley, what he did was, he did some studies to find out what really happens at the level of the brain. So, he specifically inhabited or 
the uh, visual input and he saw that there was no uh, uh, deficit into the auditory input. What he did was he gave a visual task to his subject and with this visual task he actually loaded the working memory or uh, the attention uh, the attention span with more uh, data, more items and when that happened the subject was not able the subject could not process the visual input but the auditory input was intact. Let us understand this in a more easy example. So, what Allen Bradley wanted to study is whether if the visual input is loaded, whether the auditory input can function on its own, meaning which both the processes are both the processes of visual input and the auditory input in the working memory are uh, have dissociative processes or dissociative brain regions involved into it. So, in his task he gave a visual task and loaded the attention or loaded uh, the central executive with more visual information. So, the subjects were not able to rehearse or not able to uh, study back the visual inputs, but the auditory input the auditory information which was stored in the phonological loop got a proper rehearsal. And so, when a test was done it was found out that although the subjects were not able to correctly identify visual uh, items or visual matter auditory inputs or auditory uh, test or auditory inform uh, information retrieval was not at all disturbed. This particular ex uh, experiment shows that dissociation is at the core of studying cognition. Why? Because dissociation can tell, tell us which processes have similar, although they have similar representations, but they use different mechanisms. Similar to it is the study of associations. In associations, what we actually study is whether two different processes uh, are linked or two different processes actually excite the same brain region. For example, in this case uh, experiments were done to find out whether the frontal cortex, the frontal regions and uh, another area of brain whether both of them have anything to do with spatial representations or uh, uh, of encoding of spatial, in, uh, inter, uh, spatial encodings. What they found out is that spatial in information when encoded through two different processes or two different brain regions gave rise to similar representations, meaning which both the brain processes or both the brain areas although different, but they combinedly give, ri give rise to same interpretations. Now, why is the study of dissociation association important? The study of dissociation and association is important to find out which processes all those uh, uh, emanate from the same structure, but they lead to different tasks and which if two different processes which emanate from different brain areas converge on to a particular task to find out the specificity to find out the uh, process through this. Now, the methods of studying cognition. So, there are four different methods through which cognition can be studied. And so, these methods are the behavioral methods, the correlation neural method, the causal method and the modeling. Within the modeling we have the box model approach and the neural network model approach. So, let us start with the behavioral methods. What the behavioral methods generally do is they look at directly observable behavior like reaction time, the time one per person takes to react to something or accuracy of how accurate a retrieval is from encoding. So, these processes or these events responses are mapped onto behavioral methods. The accuracy of response or the time taken to response gives us an idea onto what behavioral processes are going through in the processing of a particular mental event. Now, researchers they attempt to draw inferences about what kind of 
interpretations and what kind of processing leads to the differences in accuracy and differences in reaction time. Four popular approaches that have been or four popular methods within the behavioral method has been used. So, what we will look at is what is the ben what are the benefits of each methods, what are the drawbacks and that kind of thing into let us. So, let us go into that comparison. As you can see the major behavioral methods and methods used in cognitive psychology. The major methods are looking at the accuracy of how accurate the retrieval is from the encoding percentage that is percentage of correct responses, response times, judgments and protocol. Now, let us take this methods one by one the method of accuracy. In this method of accuracy a very good example to look at is item recall or memory recall for item such as remembering a particular job requirements or, or a particular task. The advantage is this it gives an objective idea of the processing effectiveness how effective is the mental mechanism or the mental process which is processing that particular event. The limit to accuracy method or behavioral methods of accuracy is something called the ceiling effect and floor effect. Ceiling effect is when a task is made too easy so that each person gets the highest score and so it will be very difficult to find out the exact processing mechanism. Similar to this is the floor effect in which a task is made so difficult that none of the pe people are able to solve it and due to this will not be able to a certain what processing mechanisms are at play. Also they suffer from something called speed accuracy trade off which means that as we want to be more accurate on something the more time it will it is going to take. As accuracy increases more accurate we want the speed decreases or the time to perform a task decreases it is a inverse relationship. The second method here is response time which is the time one takes to come up with a particular response. The advantage is this that it is an objective method and suitable for measuring or processing mechanisms that is at play and also those unconscious processing mechanisms. Now, this the limitation to this method is something called experimental expectancy effect and task demands. What this really means is that each experimenter when he is gets into an experiment he has certain expectancy he has a certain uh, want from the subjects and so this gets transferred to the subject subject identifies this expectancy and actually behaves in a similar way. So, if experimenter wants a subject to say yes to most of the things or take more time in responding what would really happen is the subject understands that or judges that from the from the experimenter and even if the processing is fast they take more time. The third method is called the judgment method here what really happens is to find out what really what really is happening in or how does the cognitive process really work is people are given a judgment scale and so there are seven these are seven point or eight point nine point scales which are given to people who actually judge or go ahead and rate how they are processing a particular item. It is very inexpensive to uh, collect and it accesses subjects reaction to a particular cognitive process. For example, the thing like how are you feeling right now? And so, a test can be given to people and what they could do is actually go ahead and on a 7 point scale go ahead and tell on several questions or provide responses to several questions as to how they are feeling. The problem with this method is that subjects are not aware of how to use this scale and so may get into difficulty. The last of the behavioral methods which are used to study cognition is something called the protocol collection. The method here allows subject to verbally announce what is going on or what they are doing. For example, if I ask someone to go ahead and show me how counting of 2 and 3 is done. This person has to actually start the, the experiment uh, the subject has to actually go ahead and relate how he is go uh, how he is doing the addition process 
For example, thinking of the number 2, thinking of the rule for addition, thinking of the number 3, going adding, carrying off and so on. The protocol method really uh, uses or really requires the subject to announce what is going on mentally. This method can tell you or the advantage of this method is basically it can tell you what are the steps, basic steps through which a mental processing happens or any task, what is the mental requirement for this task, what is the mental process for this task. For complex cognitive processes, this cannot obviously be used because people would not be aware of what is going on and they could not or they could not ac accurately go ahead and describe what is being going on. The next method that we use in studying cognition or cognitive processes is the correlation or the neural methods. Now, what does correlation really mean or what is this, what is the heart of this matter? The heart of this method is localization. As we discussed at the start of the lecture that the new wave of cognitive science is looking up at the brain towards the brain to explain how these cognitive processes or mental events are being processed or how is the mental event actually being processed what is going on inside the mind, what is going on inside the subject's cognition, how is the processing input and output coming into effect. Now, there I explained to you that the brain is a recent addition, why? Because the brain can objectively tell you the processing, the methods or by through which a particular mental event is being processed. And so, this method looks at finding out or localizing that area of the brain when a particular mental event is being uh, carried out. What this method does is actually tries to form a correlation between the fact that when a mental event happens, which areas of the brain actually show activity. And so, through correlation it tries to show off or tries to uh, find out which area of the brain is responsible for which kind of mental activity. This will benefit us as we will be able to specifically now tell that each mental process or each mental event or each mental mechanism is related to a particular brain area. The problem here could be that sometimes numerous other brain areas beside the area of interest also get excited and so it is, it is a little bit difficult or I would say a little challenging to pinpoint the area that is responsible for the core mental process which is being carried out. Another problem with this method is correlation does not lead to causation. Correlation simply means that two events by chance are related to each other. They do not mean that process A leads to process B and so we cannot with confidence say that this brain area excitation of a particular brain area leads to a particular mental event, a particular mental process, a particular cognitive event. Now, there are couple of techniques which are here. So, let us look at those techniques, let us look at the advantages of these techniques and the disadvantages of this technique and discuss how this method really works. So, the causal neural methods have four different techniques to look at, I am sorry three different techniques to look at. And these techniques are the neurophysiological uh, studies, the transcranial magnetic stimulation and the drugs. So, I was saying as I was saying the correlational neural method, the problems with the correlational neural method. And so, there are two problems with this. First, that many areas side along or they get along or are activated in addition to the main area of interest. And so, what really happens? the problem with this method is to localize the area of interest, because there are other areas also which inside along gets activated. And the second problem with the correlational neural method is that correlation not causing causation. Now, what really happens in correlation is two events A and B, they although show in sync activity, but correlation does not guarantee that A is the cause of B or B is caused by A. And so, there is no way to find out what process leads to or what method leads to what structural activation. In terms of uh, the brain mind 
relations, it would be very difficult to find out whether the activation in area lead to the mental processing or whether mental processing leads to the activation in an area. So, there are four different methods here, techniques here to study the correlation or the correlational localization of brain areas. The first of these technique is the EEG or the electroencephalograph. The electroencephalograph can also be used for recording something called the ERPs. Now, what the EEG or the electroencephalograph records are potentials from the scalp when a particular mental activity takes place. It is believed that a mental, when a particular mental activity takes place, there are changes in neuronal polarity and due to this a weak electrical current actually passes to the scalp surface. The EEG sensors which are placed in the scalp act record these activities and based on that are able to predict whether there is an activity change from the baseline activity. A baseline activity is an activity when no mental processing is being taking place and, and uh, when whenever an, an activity change place there will be a change and so the changed activity subtracted from the baseline activity will give you the kind of mental activity which is being taken place. EEGs are also used for recording event related potentials which are basically the potentials which are recorded when a particular stimulus is set and so after a particular stimulus is initiated from there on to when the response of the system or when the response of a person takes place, the EEG, the, uh, the electroencephalographic patterns of the brain are recorded and the time course of this EEG, the time, uh, the changes in EEG from the stimulus onset to the response is calculated or recorded or studied and this gives us an idea of what processes and what areas or what kind of pattern of activity is being uh, shown by the brain. Generally, there are some very fixed patterns uh, that the brain show. Uh, there is something called the base activity that mostly happens in everyday life is the alpha activity which falls in the 8 to 13 hertz or 13 cycle per second uh, region. Then if as a person gets more relaxed, the, uh, the amplitude of these waves increases and the frequency lowers down and it comes back to something called uh, delta and so on and so forth. So, as you get more worked up as you are doing more general activity, the amplitude is less, the frequency is more and the band pattern or the activity pattern in the brain is generally in the 8 to 14 hertz cycle per or cycle per second region. An example of using the EEG is to find out brain patterns during sleep or something like uh, uh, in terms of ERP something like P300. Now, P300 is actually a component which happens P300 is when I say a component what does it really mean? A component is a deviation in an electrical activity which takes place after the start of a event. So, when a stimulus is given uh, when a stimulus is initiated and the EEGs are recorded 300 milliseconds after the stimulus, uh, stimulus initiated on the positive direction if a peak is recorded this is called the P300. Now, the P300 generally the component P300 generally is associated with novelty. So, when the brain the, in the process the mind looks at something which is novel which is new it generates the P300 activity and so these this this can be recorded. The spatial resolution of a EEG is very poor because it cannot locate the area from where or the neuronal group from where this activity is being recorded as current passes or current moves from the base of the brain towards the surface of the brain. It forms a conical structure and so it loses most of its strength and it is very uh, difficult to to go back and or to reverse engineer from where the source of this activity is. Although newer techniques do allow for something called source localization which actually uh, from an EEG will point point a uh, gross area of where it is coming from, but generally speaking the EEGs have very poor resolution. In terms of temporal resolution 
an EEG is excellent because it can show you within within milliseconds of the activity within milliseconds of the mental event the mental activity and can show a correlation to that. So, in terms of time of processing in terms of time course of processing of mental events the EEG is very good can tell you what events in in the on the time axis what events process uh, is, uh, process or what even processes take place that that kind of information can be there gathered from an EEG. The invasiveness of this particular method of the EEG is very low as you do not have to put anything inside the body the surface sensors actually captures the information and so not much of an invasive process and the cost for this particular method is very low uh, smaller units are available in, uh, in uh, very few dollars where you can buy them and start using them. Similar to the EEG is the MEG the magnetoencephalogram where electrical activity instead of capturing the electrical activity the magnetic activity is captured. An example is detecting activity from the auditory cortex for different pitch of stones. So, here there are several sensors which are put around uh, the brain and the magnetic activity that is generated when a particular event happens a particular stimulus on after the particular sti stimulus the particular event which happens are uh, recorded or the magnetic activity uh, of which is generated by the neuronal group which is processing the event are captured through it. The spatial resolution of the magnetoencephalograph is very good it is up under 1 centimeter. In terms of temporal resolution also it is very good it is excellent. The invasiveness since you are not putting anything inside the body it is very low and so invasiveness wise MEGs are very good. But the problem is buying an MEG or establishing an MEG requires a very high cost. So, cost wise it requires a, a system which produces this magnetic moments or this produ produces this magnetic fields which actually are able to process or which actually are able to record changes in brain activity or neuronal activity when a particular mental event is going on. Third method that we use as a correlational method or for localizing brain areas that are responsible for a particular mental event is the positron emotion tomography the PET. In cognitive psychology we, ge we generally use the 15 O isotope the 15 oxygen isotope as a method for doing PET. So, what really happens is that the oxygen the 15 uh, uh, the O 15 isotope which is radioactive is injected with normal uh, within the normal body and so this particular isotope is uh, moving around the body. So, when the brain does it is believed that when, when the brain does a particular function it pulls up more and more uh, uh, blood and with the blood more and more water also transports to the brain. And so, when a particular act, uh, region of the brain shows more 15 the accumulation of more 15 isotope that is the region which is uh, correlated or which is assumed to be active in a particular process and this is how the uh, PET of 15 o, uh, oxygen isotope is done. Generally it is used to study or mostly it is used to study language areas of the brain of how the language areas process or what is the processing that happens in language area when we actually uh, speak. The spatial resolution is very good up to 1 centimeter, but the temporal resolution is very poor because it takes almost 40 seconds to generate an image out of uh, the PET of 15 oxygen uh, isotope or the O 15 isotope. Invasiveness is high as we in uh, as we inject an uh, isotope of oxygen which is radioactive into the blood and so this has radioactive properties which could uh, lead to problems. Although uh, the kind of radioactivity that uh, happens with an oxygen with O 15 isotope is as less as uh, what a airline pilot would actually get through in half a year of his work. So, it is it is very uh, uh, very less, but still it is radioactive and so it is uh, best to avoid it. On terms of the purchase cost, it is a high purchase cost because PET needs cyclotron and PET cameras and things for uh, uh, noticing those sensors which can go ahead and record the radioactivity the low radioactivity of this oxygen isotope. So, it is very costly in that method. And improvement on the PET is the MRI and the fMRI which was 
uh, which is a new addition to the study of the brain or brain processes or cognitive processes. The MRI on, on one hand is actually stores the structural integrity of how the structure of the brain is. The fMRI on the other hand shows the blood oxygen level dependent or how much oxygenated blood is taken up by the brain when a particular activity is uh, being, uh, uh, being processed by the brain. The MRI works on the principle of body magnets or uh, at, uh, atoms of the, uh, of the body and how they align to an external magnetic field. So, what the MRI generally does? It produces a uniform magnetic field to which most atoms of the body align and then a radio uh, uh, pulse is created or radio pulse is, it is generated which disturbs the alignment of most atoms of the, uh, of the area which is in the MRI scanner. The speed of returning back is calculated when when the magnets disalign when the particular poles or the uh, the particular elements in the, in the body the particular atoms of elements in the body when uh, a radio isotope disaligns them from the from the uh, alignment that the uh, mri magnet does it returns back and the speed with which they return back is calculated and from there an image is generated and these images or the speed at which the different atoms get back or uh, they come back is different for different different media like bone uh, skin or uh, the other tissues in, in, in the body they have different speeds of returning back or this is calculated and an image is generated. In an fMRI what we really do is uh, the amount of uh, oxygenated blood in comparison to the deoxygenated blood at a particular brain region which is processing a particular event uh, is, is taking that is calculated and that gives us an idea of which region of the brain is showing an activity through a sensor. The spatial resolution of an both an MRI and fMRI is very superb, it is very good in the terms of millimeter range. The temporal resolution is not that good, but it depends upon uh, the level of resolution that you want or uh, generally it is in, in terms of several seconds. So, not like the EEG which can give you uh, the millisecond kind of a temporal resolution, but not as low as uh, the PET which gives which takes almost 40 seconds to produce an image. So, MRIs have decent decent time requirement or this takes decent time to produce those images. The invasiveness is low because MRI does not uh, MRI and fMRI does not inject anything into the body. So, the invasiveness is low, but here the purchase cost is very high because the kind of magnets that, that the MRI and fMRI uses are ele huge electromagnets and they have huge uh, amount of cost involved into them. The last method that we use here is called the optical imaging method and here this is a recent addition. So, it has been found out that the brain is transparent to certain kind of uh, light waves and when these light waves are shown into the brain through a, uh, through a laser, the speed with which they return back can give you an idea of how much blood is flowing through that particular area. And so, this can be used, this method is now being used to find out the amount of blood traveling through a particular area depending on how much uh, light, laser light is being reflected back through uh, various tissues and, and, and various substances in, in the brain. It is the special resolution at present is very poor and the, uh, the temporal resolution it depends on the level of resolution and several minutes takes up for, from forming an image. The invasiveness is generally uh, medium to low as lasers are uh, shown onto or lasers are focused onto your brain. So, it has some level of an invasiveness, but not too high. The cost of purchase is very low, but the temporal and special resolution is not appropriate. One of the examples is the FNRI which is uh, uh, functional uh, optical imaging uh, suit which is available these days. Another method of studying cognition is through using the causal neural method of studying cognition. What does this method do? In this method it is assumed that if certain regions of the brain are required for certain activity, what would happen if that region of the brain 
is somehow not allowed to do any activity or is stopped from doing activity. And so, one of the uh, one of the particular uh, methods within this approach is using patients who have certain brain damage. So, suppose the Broca area is responsible for speech and so, if somebody has a deficit in the broker area and if certain type of speech related experiments are given to, uh, to them and compared to a particular normal uh, uh, person, it would be easy to understand what kind of uh, what kind of activity the brain does, what is the requirement of this area and so on and so forth. So, here in this in, in the neurophysiological studies patients with localized brain damage or brain damage to certain areas are used and they compared with people who have no brain damage and this is how the cognitive processes or the mental processes that go on when a particular mental activity is being done is actually studied. Example could be deficit in understanding the no, how nouns and verbs are processed and so people who have deficit in this area, if you give them a noun and a verb, the area since it is deficit, so no, it will show no activity, whereas people who do not have deficits will show different activity and so that will be enough to say that this area is responsible for the particular kind of act that is being required. The advantages is of this method is testing theories of causal role of specific brain areas, testing theories of shared and distinct processing and used in different tasks relatively easy and inexpensive to collect. The limitation is we do not find too many people who have damaged areas and so the idea is it is it is very difficult to uh, find people with damaged areas. Also when damage to a particular area is there, there will be uh, related areas which might be affected by the damage. So, it is very difficult to localize whether the this damage is to this area or with this damage the damaged brain area also has any relation with other areas. The second method in uh, this particular group is called the transcranial magnetic stimulation. Now, in TMS there are two types of TMSs, one is called the single pulse and the other is called the repeated TMS or the repeated trans, uh, pulse ma uh, trans ma transcranial magnetic stimulation. What really happens here it, uh, it is that a huge coil is put into or near or on the surface of an area that you want to temporarily inhabit and a large current is passed through this coil. The magnetic field that is generated by this coil temporarily inhabits a particular area and through, through that we can find out whether the disturb how what will happen if a particular area which is known to be associated with a particular uh, activity cognitive activity if it is disrupted what really happens. So, what we could do or uh, studies of how visual imagery is different from perception can be done by using TMS, TMS or uh, using a RTMS and blocking the occipital lobe. Now, there is a difference between single pulse TMS and RTMS. In single pulse TMS, a single pulse is given after the stimulus is, uh, is, is generated and the time course of this pulse is recorded and that gives us an idea of how the or what activity is happening in that area. Whereas, in an RTMS repeated pulses are given over a particular area. So, that these weak pulses they add up together to inhabit a particular area. The inhibition happens because the neurons under that area becomes too fast too uh, to extended or they, they are fired so many times that they they uh, go through a phase of non firing and that inhabits the area or that, that depolarization inhabits that activity in that area. So, advantages it is it has the same advantage as the neurophysiological studies, but here the lesions are restricted and also the idea here is that in these regions in 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 the TMS the the disruption is for a very brief brief period of time and so patients can come out, out of it or subjects can come out of it. Also TMSs can be done for surface areas, it cannot be done for deep areas of the brain uh, and so it is one of the disadvantage or limitation of this particular method. Another method which can 
relate or which can show how a particular brain area disrupting a particular brain area has effects on a particular mental process is using specific drugs. So, here what happens is a particular drug is specifically used and these drugs inhabit a particular area of interest and so once this area of interest is inhabited the same task is given to a person who has taken this drug which inhabits area and a person who has not had drugs which inhabits this area and comparisons are made. These comparisons give us an idea of what really happens or how mental processes, what brain areas are involved, what mental processes is being processed and what is the time course of process of these uh, mental events. The problem an uh, example was the disruption of uh, disruptive action of non adrenaline which is crucial for the operation of hippocampus. So, non adrenaline injection is given to the hippocampus and the hippocampus actually becomes temporarily disturbed and so when you give a memory task to this person he will not be able to process this memory task and not come up with uh, 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 better of how uh, 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 or the particular travel paradigm in comparison to somebody who has no disruptions and this will show how much or to what extent does which part of hippocampus relates to a particular memory type. Drugs when used to inhabit a particular area affects not only the area of interest, but also affects other area which is related to this area and so this effect can also be uh, it uh, can 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 be generalized to other areas similar similar to this effect the tms also has this particular disadvantage where activation of a particular area can lead to activation of subsequent areas and so what would happen is the disruption will not be in that particular area but also move out or generalize to other areas of brain and so to stay with confidence that this is this disruption of this area is responsible for a particular mental act is uh, becomes a little bit dicey. Also the limitation is that many drugs can create many other uh, problems and so this is this has to be used under supervision. The last method that we discuss here of studying cognition or cognitive psychology is using modeling. So, in psychology models are implemented as computer programs which are meant to mimic the underlying mental representation and processes that produces different specific types of human performances. So, generally models are made and these models try and explain the different processes events that actually happen when a particular uh, mental event or a particular cognition happens. There are two types of models which are studied in cognitive psychology. One of these is the process model and the second is the neural network model. So, what is the process model? The process model specifies a sequence of processes that converts an input into output and can these kind of processes can be used to generate flow charts. So, basically it is a box diagram kind of a thing where you get from one uh, one phase to another one event to another uh, event and the um, processes which relate these events together. Coming back to understanding the process model, let us recall the structure process trade off that we saw in the last class. And so, in the last class we saw Sternberg's example in which what he did was he, he wanted to study the mental process of how comparisons are made in, in the uh, comparisons are made in cognition. And so, what he did was he gave his subjects a particular number of items to remember and then these items were tested the retrieval of this the memory for these items were tested through a probe. And what Sternberg proposed is that this search for the target in the list of items that is being studied or the, that is being remembered happens through a serial process. Generally speaking, this idea that a serial process look through a list of items which have been stayed in memory can be explained through a process model and this is the process model which explains how this serial processing takes place. So, generally how this experiment would work is when a probe is given the probe is first encoded. Prior to this people are given a list to remember and the list has several 
numbers or several letters into it. And what the job is the subjects look at a probe and then find out whether this probe is present in this list or not. And to explain this process a process model can be developed. How will the process model really work? So, look at this in finding out or scanning whether the probe is present in the list which is remembered the first step is encoding of the probe. This is followed by scanning and comparing where processes internal processes take the probe and match it with each item which is represented which is stored into the, the memory. For each item after a comparison a decision has to be made. So, let us say this if we have 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 stored list of items stored or 5 numbers stored in our memory and if we want to compare whether 3 is present or not how this model will really work or how this process will really work in terms of mental effect is that 3 is first encoded later on 3 is matched scanned and compared with the first item this which is 1 and so a decision has to be made here whether 1 is 3 or not since both the representations for 3 and 1 are different uh, response has to be executed here the response is no and the process moves to the second item. Now, 3 is taken in compared with 2 since both the representations are different uh, response here has to be generated which says that 3 is not equal to 2 and so we do not find a match and we move to the third item which is 3. Now, here 3 and 3 have the same representations and so we get a yes response make a decision the yes response comes in and so in terms of serial processing the process does not stop here it continues continues to the end of the list and then gives the final answer. So, that is how the process model explains the process model ex actually goes ahead and explains how this simple job or simple task of comparing a probe with a list which has been already remembered actually goes ahead. The problem with this process model is it tells you about the processes that goes through or the processes that happen when this list comparison or probe list testing is done, but it does not tell you how does the brain or what neural factors play role into this particular whole structure. So, this has this is basically this kind of process models are basically influenced by the behaviorists which believe that the input output sequence is what is of important to us, but what is inside is not of importance to us. And so, it does not give you the brain structures the brain processes which actually go ahead and lead to the final, final answer of comparisons or final comparisons that are done. And so, to counter that neural network models were done or thought of. Now, what is the neural network model? It relies on interconnected units which are not just input output units, but it has a hidden unit which is generally called the brain unit into it. And so, most inputs are connected to a hidden unit and the hidden unit are further connected to an output unit. So, if encoding of if a input unit is given this input unit then goes ahead and makes connections with this hidden units which are generally neurons. Now, this type of uh, uh, neural network structure that I am showing you is a simple feed forward network. What happens here is there are 3 units L 1, L 2 and 3, 3 inputs which have been taken and these inputs are then compared or then process through H 1, H 2, H 3, 3 different brain uh, networks or neuronal networks. Now, each of this network can have only 2 activity, one is either it can be excitatory which is the I response or inhibitory O response. So, when a particular input a particular representation from the environment is encoded this particular network or this particular response uh, neuronal network will either be excitatory will either pass along will either move along this information to the next network and so a connection or it could show inhibitory whereas, it will not uh, process this information further. Also these connections that the input layer or the input item has with the hidden layer has weights into it and depending on what weight it is what is the strength of this connection will decide whether this inhibit whether this response of excitation or inhibition will these uh, new will this hidden units actually show. And based on the excitatory or inhibitory input or mode 
of the hidden layer and the weights of the input layer, the output layer is finally, or the outputs are finally determined. And so, th that is how we see that L 1 or I 1 represents gives to give rise to O 2 and the hidden layer the neural network or the group of neurons which actually process it how does it really function. So, this particular model shows us gives us several uh, benefit for example, it, it, it shows us what are the neural codes which are there which are which are uh, which are responsible for this kind of an output and it distinguishes these neural codes from mental representation. So, it does not just tell you mental representation of how a event is represented in, in memory, but also what are the brain states or what are the neuronal states which are processing this particular neuronal unit. So, that brings us to the end of this session and to do a quick recap in this session what we did was we looked at the different methods of studying cognition and uh, we looked at the heart of this uh, study uh, the use of different methods that the the basic point being that as we use different methods we get some whatever the uh, the loophole from one method turns out to be the benefit from another method and so we get a more comprehensive picture if one method explains process A, but cannot explain process B. Maybe there is another method which can explain process B and uh, uh, comes up with another limitations. And so, looking at the benefits and limitations of all these methods give us a more complete picture of how cognitive or cognitive processes develop. And so, within that we looked at four different types of uh, methods or four different uh, techniques of studying cognition right from behavioral techniques where we look at accuracy, response time, judgments and protocol to coming up uh, with techniques which actually go ahead and localize or pinpoint a brain area which is active when a particular mental process is being carried out and uh, methods like EEG, PET, MRI or fMRI or optical imaging to looking at causal methods which actually disrupt a brain area which is believed to be active when a particular event is being taking place a particular mental event is being taking place to the methods of uh, modeling where uh, a process is designed a computer stimulation is designed which mimics what the brain does. So, instead of studying the brain itself um, um, a mimic or uh, model of that is done and studied through computer stimulations to find out uh, what will happen if a particular input or a particular group of brains, uh, brain areas uh, which, which are known to respond in particular ways, if they take in an information, how what is the possible output that can come in. Thank you.